Um, I was asked to talk a little bit today on the subject of humor in poetry, so <laughs> um, some of my work is funny, I hope, or <laughs> some of it is serious, but I was going to focus on the lighter stuff today. And um, I wanted to start by saying that most of us, when we think of poetry, probably think of it as deadly serious stuff. But poetry doesn't have to be difficult or depressing. It can really be just as pleasurable as other forms of media and entertainment. Um, who of us in childhood did not love the rhymes of Dr. Seuss? I do not love green eggs and ham. I do not like them, say my am. <laughs> or Shel Silverstein. Remember, um, did you hear about Ticklish Tom? He got tickled by his mom, that, that, that poet. Um, we can all recite nursery rhymes from heart by heart. Um, some of us grew up with the poems of A.E. Milne, the Christopher Robin poems. Wherever I am, there's always poo, there's always poo in me, or that. Um, Ogden Nash, Isabel met enormous bear, Isabel, Isabel didn't care, <laughs> right? <laughs> and chances are many of us know Dorothy Parker's poem, News Item, by heart, that men seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses. So, um, you know, I don't think people lose their love of funny poetry when they grow up. But the problem is that there are almost no places left that will publish it. Uh, just a few decades ago, women's magazines, as well as magazines like The New Yorker's, The New Yorker would regularly publish so-called light verse poetry that you know is meant to make you laugh. But today, there's really only one print journal in existence that still publishes humorous poetry on a regular basis, and that's Light Quarterly. And that's true even though the best-selling poet in England, Wendy Cope, is a funny poet. And also, um, last year, there was a breakout best-selling book, which uh, whose title I probably can't say out loud in here, but it's <laughs> Go the uh, to Sleep, <laughs> a book for new parents trying to get their children to, <laughs> to go to sleep at night, <laughs> was a, a best-seller in this country as well. Um, the Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Richard Wilbur, who was a U.S. Poet Laureate, writes for children as well as for adults, uh, well, rather, we pretend that his funny stuff is for children, even though grown-ups get some of the jokes that, that the children don't get. Um, for example, his book, The Pig in the Spigot, deals with words that are inside of other words. And he has little poems about them. And one example is, C, S-E-A, is in nausea, N-A-S, N-A-U-S-E-A, which seems strange to me, since nausea comes of tossing in the sea. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Dorothy Parker as well as Wendy Cope. And if you don't know Cope's work, I'll read you a brief example. This is Two Cures for Love. One, don't see him, don't phone or write a letter. Two, the easy way, get to know him better. Another light verse I've admired for many years is Gail White, who lives just down the road from us in Brobridge, Louisiana. Gail's poem on Louisiana politics goes like this. The politician, like the tabby's young, attempts to clean his backside with his tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Other funny poets you might want to check out if you've been enjoying, been enjoying these brief samples are Melissa Balmain, R.S. Gwynn, and Eric McHenry. A couple of years ago, after I finished writing a very serious poetry manuscript, Jazz Funeral, which dealt with topics like my father's death and Hurricane Katrina and my own brush with um, cancer, I started writing silly poems just to amuse myself, just, you know, <laughs> just for my own enjoyment. But I found that when I would tuck a few of them in at the end of a poetry reading, that other people seemed to enjoy them too. So I'll read a few of those today. Um, some of them are just purely silly. 
this is an this one is actually an older one that I wrote when I first moved to Louisiana and I could not get over the fact that there were so many dead armadillos at the side of the room. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I thought, you know, I've never seen a live armadillo, but there must be live armadillos <laughs> producing, you know, these armadillos who are dead, or else where would they be coming from? So I wrote this little poem called Dead Armadillo Song. I've never seen a live armadillo, but I drive Highway 90 where the shoulders littered with the colder, deader little critters getting stiffer and stiffer. <coughs> they seem to have weights like living room drapes in their bottoms, for they lie with their feet to the sky. My God, there's a lot of them, fat as stuffed ottomans, World War I tanks snared in terrorist warfare, or small coats of armor whose knights became farmers. <laughs> Some of them are just, you know, purely silly. Like, um, there was a little newspaper in England having a competition for a poem that began with the line, whenever you see a rhinoceros. Now what rhymes with rhinoceros? Nothing rhymes with rhinoceros. So I took it as a challenge and I wrote, whenever you see a rhinoceros stampeding in an awful fuss, what gets them so pissed off at us? <laughs> you best buy a sarcophagus. It's ant-like, not grasshopperous, to plan should one not stop for us because it could land on top of us and make beef stroganoff of us. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, um, some of these have to do with uh, the plight of getting older, not very gracefully. Um, this one, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. I get my house clean once a week. I get my hair done twice. A host of chefs bring fine cuisine, my taste buds to entice. I must have married rich, you guess, on figure, looks, and charm. The truth is much less glamorous. I fell and broke my arm. <laughs> That's true if you want lots of great food brought to your house and people volunteering to clean for you. <laughs> yeah, better to break the left one if you're right-handed. <laughs> I'd, re I'd recommend. Um, other little things in here, let's see, I have... Um, this one goes back to my childhood when it seemed like whenever I would ask for a certain present for birthdays or, or for Christmas or something. My parents would always get me the generic version of whatever it was that I was asking for. So when I asked for a Ken doll, you know, to marry my Barbie doll, they got me Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and many years later I wrote this, which is my first and only rap poem. <laughs> I should really have somebody up here you know, like keeping a beat, but well, Alan Dahl rap. When I was 10, I wanted a Ken to marry Barbie. I was into patriarchy for plastic dolls 11 inches tall, because the 60s hadn't yet happened at all. Those demonstrations, assassinations, conflagrations across the nation, still nothing but a speck in the imagination. Yeah, Ken was the man, but my mama had the cash. And the boy doll she bought me was Ursatz. Alan was his name from the discount store. He cost a dollar ninety-nine. Ken was two dollars more. <laughs> Alan's hair was felt, stuck on with cheap glue, like the top of a pool table scuffed up by cues, and it fell out in patches when he was brand new. Ken's hair was plastic, molded in waves, coated with paint. No Ken bad hair days. Well, they wore the same size, they wore the same clothes, but Ken was a player. 
fire and Alan was a Bose. <laughs> Barbie looked around at all the other Barbies driving up in dream cars at the Ken and Barbie party and knew life had dealt her a jack, not a king. Knew if Alan bought her an engagement ring, it wouldn't scratch glass. Bet your ass no class made of cubic zirconia or cubic plexiglass. Kens would move Barbies out of their townhouses, into their dream houses, Pepto-Bismol pink from the rugs to the sink, wrapper and mink. But Alan was a bum. Our doll was not dumb. She knew a fronter from a chum. Take off that tuxedo. Alan would torpedo for the Barca lounger. Bye-bye libido. Hello VCR. No job, no car. Drinking up her home bar. Stinking up her boudoir with a cigar. Shrinking up the cash advance on her MasterCard. Trying on her pink penoir. Until she'd be saying, where's that giant hand? Used to make him stand. Used to make him walk. <laughs> and then um, I I really love <laughs> <laughs> That's I really love the poet Emily Dickinson. I confess that I didn't when I was the you know when I was the age of some of the audience here. I, I didn't really appreciate her until you know, I hit my midlife crisis. But, <laughs> but um, I do love her poetry now, and I don't understand why, when I love her so much, I started taking the first lines of her poems and rewriting the endings. It's, you know, it's like potato chips. You do one, and then you're insatiable. You have to keep doing more. So I have all these little, you know, sort of one to two line, sometimes longer, poems that begin with a line by Emily Dickinson and end with a line by me. You be the judge of which one you like the best. <laughs> it's hers or mine. And I call it the lost fascicle, the collection, because she used to, you know, stitch her poems up into little pamphlets, you know, called fascicles. So this is the one that was never found. And I'll, I'll read you some of them. Um, 128. Bring me the sunset in a cup. And a, and a tequila sunrise while you're up. <laughs> um, cocoon above, cocoon, cocoon below. I hate to dust, as well you know. Uh, let's see. 280. I felt a funeral in my brain and mourners to and fro. I sure was glad when light turned green to hear that rap song go. <laughs> 304. The day came slow till 5 o'clock. At last, a bourbon on the rocks. <laughs> 333. The grass so little has to do. If you're watching it, that makes two. <laughs> Uh, let's see, 465. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The swatter had been left outside. <laughs> um, 712. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The Harley should have tipped me off, and the Hell's Angels tea. <laughs> 754. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day. I had the sense to empty it and put the shells away. <laughs> um, 1052, I never saw a moor. I never saw the sea. I traveled all around the world but texted constantly. <laughs> and let's see. 1149, I noticed people disappeared when but a little child. Perhaps because I kicked their shins, I was a little wild. <laughs> But that's how that that's how that goes. <laughs> um, I've started doing it to Shakespeare too, but I'll, I'll spare you those. <laughs> and let's see. In a, in addition to um, the funny poems, I in my serious poems as well. I think there are often flashes of humor, just as there are in life when we're going through trials and tribulations. You know, there are usually lighter moments in the midst of the darker moments, and 
to kind of illustrate that, I'm going to read some poems from a series that I wrote about growing up in an alcoholic family and then in adult life trying to um, break free of those patterns of alcoholism and codependency you know that you learn in childhood and that seem like normal you know to you when you've grown up in that situation um, and you know they're serious but I think you know little there are little flashes of, of, of lightness in them too and they're from the, the book Rhythm and Booze and the first one is maraschino cherries which Somebody at the, <laughs> at the little meet and greet had, had read. Maraschino cherries. Three little girls on the morning after, out in the kitchen poking around for cherries soaked in whiskey like a bomb of grown-up secrets. Other times we found by mom's clipped earrings and kicked off shoes, blue glass monkeys on swizzle sticks, doll-sized oriental parasols, cocktail napkins with jokes we didn't get. Cherries as precious as Burmese rubies. Once in a while, while the grown-ups slept, we ate our fill of cherries from the jar, but even then, we liked the booze ones best. <laughs> and this one is a villanelle form some of you might have studied, where the first and third lines repeat, repeat, repeat all the way through. It's called Kissing the Bartender, and it's about, you know, sort of, you know, silly puppy love, you know, summer bubblegum, you know, sort of infatuation. And you can tell that it's not going to, it's not going to come out very well. Kissing the Bartender. The summer we kissed across the bar, I felt 16 at 36, as if you were a movie star I had a crush on from afar. My chest was flat, my legs were sticks the summer we kissed across the bar. Balancing on the rail was hard. Spilled beer made my elbows stick. You could have been a movie star, backlit, golden, lofting a jar of juice or Bloody Mary mix the summer we kissed across the bar. Over the sink, the limes, as far as you could lean, you leaned. I kissed the movie screen, a movie star. Drink stayed empty, ashtrays tarred. The customers got mighty pissed the summer we kissed across the bar. Summer went by like a shooting star. <laughs> and, and this one, um, if you have ever had the experience of waking in the night and hearing a blast of noise come out of the telephone and you know that someone is calling you from a bar and that, you know, whatever is going to happen next is not going to be good. <laughs> you just know from that noise. This is bar noise. A blast of bar noise on the telephone. Is the ceiling tin? Is the mural fest? He doesn't know where he is. I'm home. So much for spending the night alone, nightgown, pimple creamed, getting some rest. The seven digits of my telephone, deep in his brain, as breathing on his own. Blanket to couch, I make a nest to wait for him till he gets home. On a bar napkin, in a street unknown, in a hand unknown, Somebody copies my street address from the chain book by the payphone to give the cab. He's a boomerang thrown on the night savannah, returning to the breast that launched him. That's the doorbell, not the phone, and it's his body, but nobody's home. Okay. <laughs> All right. Few people have had those phone calls <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> and the last one I'll read from that series is a sort of happy, temporarily happy ending called The Bartender Quits Drinking. It's, it's about Lent starting, which is about to happen soon. <laughs> so it's kind of a seasonal poem. The Bartender Quits Drinking. The Matter De La Rosa parking lot is always full on Fridays during Lent. I hear them chanting Stations of the Cross as I double park for the pastry shop. 
this boozeless season giving us a bent for donuts, candy, soda pop. 20 years ago, a schoolgirl, hot in my coat, a lace mantilla on my head. I swayed like them through stations of the cross, thinking about forbidden chocolate ice cream and dreading the dinner ahead. Fish sticks parceled out in meager lots. Though I am not one of the good who got a smudge of ashes to make amends to Jesus for his time on the cross. It's funny how the drinking stopped to coincide with the start of Lent. I mark each sober day with a cross. I come to joy in a season of loss. Okay. And I'll read one about written in Natchitoches, if I can find it. This one is, <laughs> this one, this one is called War or Ants on the Hummingbird Theater. When I first moved to Natchitoches, I was living <coughs> in a little rental house on Cane River, and I didn't know anybody yet, so I was spending a lot of time kind of sitting out on the back porch watching the birds and, and the river, <coughs> and trying to keep ants from getting in my hummingbird theater. This is, they won't cross a chalk line, he said, so being a teacher and having a box full on hand, I stood on a lawn chair and daubed at the cottonwood's lowest branch until there was a white ring around it. But the branch was three-dimensional, not flat like a sidewalk, and the ants cut a double-lane Ho Chi Minh trail through <laughs> knob mountains and peeling bark lowlands where the chalk line had missed. Ants, said my bird book, can be stymied in their attempts to take over a hummingbird feeder by coating a section of the hanging wire with petroleum jelly, mineral oil, or vegetable shortening. So I stood on the lawn chair again, mounding fingerfuls of Vaseline onto the inch-long S-hook, and it worked for a couple of days, just until there were so many bodies piled up in the Vaseline <laughs> bog that the living were able to cross on the backs of the dead, the way the French crossed the trenches of Verdun. Make the wire longer, said a voice, not that of the ants, angel. So I unbent a coat hanger to its full length, buttered it with Vaseline, and stood on the lawn chair again, hooking one end to the tree and the other to the feeder. That did it. The ants surrendered just as the ruby throats were starting to leave town for the orchards of Costa Rica, indifferent to the winner's cup, so many had lost their lives over. <laughs> and I'll read this one just because one of the little artworks, it's tiny, and one of the little artworks was done about a moonrise on the Cane River. The moon is a surprised white face over the darkening river, even before a pair of blue-gray wings swoops down between the O of its mouth and the O of a surfacing fish and the phone rings and it's you in Baton Rouge grilling a silver catfish and staring at the moon. Aww. Little happy poem. <laughs> now tell them about the artworks over at NSU. Oh, uh, uh, yes, um, several, several people there did artworks based on one of the poems in one of my books. And um, I, how long are they going to be on display? Is there? Um, I would wait uh, for a few days. Yeah. yeah. We don't have a time limit yet. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep them up. Where are they? Longer. Good. They're right in the uh, Leesville, NSU Leesville Library. Mm -hmm. They have them out in the, the main uh, study room. Oh, everybody's welcome. Free mm -hmm. open doors. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I thought I'd read a couple of sonnets from Jazz Funeral. I got on a little sonic kick writing that book. But um, not formal, not like, you know, Shakespearean sonnets. I, I try to write them in conversational English so that you almost don't notice that they're sonnets, I hope. And this one is called Rising and Falling. I started thinking, like, you know, why do they say falling in love when, you know, that feeling is so elated, you know, like, <laughs> it's when you're out of love that it should be falling. So, <laughs> I tried to, I've tried to put that in a poem. 
Why not say falling out of love, the truth, and rising into love, like other things, soap bubbles, dust motes, helium balloons, and bird or Icarus or insect wings that yank the stupid kite strings of the heart by catching giddy updrafts while they last before they plummet back where all things start in a smooth landing or a fatal crash. It's true. One time I logged 11 years of soaring therm thermal currents fancy free before I saw the telltale signs appear that meant he'd fallen out of love with me. Don't trust the crap you read about in rhyme. Gravity will win out every time. <laughs> <laughs> Two of these poems were actually read on the radio by Garrison Keeler. So after hearing him do them, you know, I feel like, you know, my squeaky voice sounds really, you know, wimpy by comparison, but <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> this one, um <laughs> any physicists in the audience? I hope okay. I hope I haven't messed up the science on this. But um you know that famous quantum physics ex experiment where um, two little photons, two little particles, sort of, um, you know, after they've been involved in an experiment together, they keep like, you know, mimicking each other for the rest of their existence, even though they're far apart. Um, I, was, I was thinking about that when something reminded me of my ex-husband. Because the first year we were married, we watched Red Sox games all the time on a little tiny little black and white TV. And I knew when the Red Sox were really hot that, you know, that he was watching the game and he must be thinking of me. So I wrote this, particle <laughs> physics. They say two photons fired through a slit stay paired together to the end of time. If one is polarized to change its spin, the other does a U-turn on a dime. Although they fly apart at speeds of light and never cross each other's paths again, like us, a couple in the 70s, divorced for almost 30 years since then. Tonight, a Red Sox batter homered twice to beat the Yankees in their playoff match. And sure as I was born in Boston, when that second ball deflected off the bat, I knew your thoughts were flying back to me though your location was a mystery. Oh, oh thanks. And this one used book. Sadly, this really happened to me. But the good thing is that I wound up winning a British sonnet contest with this poem. And I got... Um, 1,400 British pounds <laughs> for the poem, and I got to go to take a trip to England and you know have a little reception there and everything. So it all turned out, it turned out okay. I guess it was worth the misery for the end result. <laughs> this is called Used Book. What luck, an open bookstore up ahead as rain lashed awnings over Royal Street, and then to find the books were second hand with one whole wall assigned to poetry. And then, as if that wasn't luck enough to find between Jarrell and Weldon Keys, the blue on cream familiar backbone of my chapbook, out of print since 83. Its cover very slightly coffee stained, but aging all in all, no worse than flesh through all those cycles of the seasons since its publication by a London press. Then, out of luck, I read the name inside, the man I thought would love me till I die. <laughs> and I'll, I'll end with a happy one, <coughs> and then maybe, while I'm taking questions, if there are any that you wanted to hear that I didn't read, I can, I can read those too. This is um, a former student of mine is getting married in April, and she asked me if I would read a poem at her wedding, and I said, well, I'll try to write one, you know, if I, if I get inspired. So I talked to her about how they met, and they had the strangest meeting of any couple I'd ever heard of. They met at his Halloween party 
and she was like a creature from hell or something. She had fake blood all over her face, and he was dressed as the Duke of Darkness. So, you know, that's how they met, and then a few days after that, they had a real date, <laughs> and they fell in love. <laughs> I said, okay, let's see what I can do with that. This is how they met for Hanno and Sabrina, and it's nice that it's Valentine's Day Eve to read the readings. In Hollywood, they call it meeting cute, a costume party, Halloween, his place, fake blood congealed on the cadaver's face, the Duke of Darkness in a formal suit, throw in a jealous date, a loud dispute, a streaking guest, a pirate giving chase. In all that drunken revelry, what grace made Cupid aim his little bow and shoot? One rainy evening after Halloween, they sat and talked until a restaurant closed. The Duke unmasked an engineer in jeans. The corpse, a teacher, lovely as a rose. May we who bless their marriage be as wise to recognize true love beneath the skies. And if you have any questions or, you know, any that you'd like to hear that I didn't read, let me know. We've got, I think we've got 15 minutes or so at least. Yes? What was your inspiration for Kissing the Bartender? For Kissing the Bartender? <laughs> that, you know, that was a sort of, you know, silly summer infatuation with um, a fellow who was actually, you know, People are always like, you know, I'm, I'm really an actor, I'm not really a waiter. You know, in, in his case, he was really an artist who started bartending so that he would have light to paint during the day. That was the, <laughs> but I think he started, you know, drinking a little bit too much of the merchandise and sleeping through the day. <laughs> and never, but that was, that was the original. My poems usually begin in experience, but I will change things around, you know, to make it a better poem. I don't, you know, I don't stick completely, you know, to, to fact. But generally, they're, they're grounded in experience. I'll say, yes. What was your inspiration for The Mermaid? Oh, The Mermaid poem. That, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I, I, I had... I think kind of a, almost a double inspiration for that. That want me to read it so yes. people know what it is, and then I'll, then I'll explain it. Okay, it's in here. Let's see if I can find it. Mermaid, mermaid. Yeah, it's in two parts. The mermaid story. One, we've all heard half of the fairy tale. A mermaid rescued a drowning prince swam him to shore, then pined away because she missed the weight of him and the heat of his breath against her neck. Nothing at all like the trickle of cool salt water flushed from delicate gills when she kissed the mermen back in school. But since there are witches underwater as well as over, within a year she bargained away her tail for legs and her tongue too, as legs were dear. She married the prince. His body hair tickled like beach grass parched in sun. An eel grew where his legs forked. She couldn't speak this to anyone. <laughs> two. Back in the anti-universe, a woman writer with two tongues rooted to the floor of her mouth like anemones has just swum so deep, so deep with her freak tail, the sea spins and her brain goes black. We'll see if the tongue she bargained for can send a message back. Part of the inspiration was that fairy tale since disney you know, about the little mermaid who, um, you know, falls in love with a prince right. and in order to live on land has to give up her tongue and her, and her tail, you know, so that she can have human legs. And, and in the original <clears throat> fairy tale, she can't speak. She's mute, you know, after that. And I was thinking about, you know, women writers who, you know, in order, in order to be a good woman writer, you know, sometimes you have to kind of um, pull away from, you know, sort of the expectations, you know, that our culture puts on, you know, on women. You know, you have to march to a different drummer or something. 
And I was thinking about, well, what if there were a woman on land who wanted that fishtail and who wanted the extra tongue? <laughs> you know, so she bargained like, okay, you know, you can have my legs and I'll take your tail and the extra tongue. And that would be like, you know, the woman artist who's going to dive into the unconscious, you know, who's going to dive down, you know, into those depths, you know, from which the creative process comes. But, you know, in order to do it, she might have to kind of, um, you know, buck society, buck social convention, you know, maybe not, you know, live the life the happily ever after with the prince. <laughs> but anyhow, that, that's what was going on in my head. But whatever a reader gets from it is, you know, might be very different. Yes. Um, what process do you use to finalize your poems? Oh, good question. My writing process for poetry is, is somewhat different than it is for prose because you know I've written a lot of um, I've written a lot of prose as well. You know, a nonfiction book on you know a Vietnam War um, hero and you know, lots of articles and things like that. And when I write prose, it's very easy to write a terrible first draft. You know, it's, it's easy for me to schedule time every day and, you know, plug away and write terrible stuff and then go back, you know, and revise and, you know, I outline. But when I write poetry, I, I find that I really do need to be in the right mood to write poetry. I can't just say I'm gonna sit down you know, from two to four and write a poem, because it just, unless I have that spark of inspiration, it just doesn't work. But while I am writing, I do cross out, cross out, cross out, you know, as, as I'm writing, I'm constantly.